concepts help me in the answer is yes. And then for those, most of us, I have only the limited ability to apply supplemental irrigation. So if I learn to track potential evapotranspiration, will that help me? And the answer is yes. And as we get into the talk, as I get further into the talk, I hope to be able to explain that to you in more detail. Before we go any further, I'd like everybody to take a piece of paper and turn it over, either across the top or down the side. I want you to write the word logic, L-O-G-I-C. I've got 30 minutes here today to talk to you about various concepts about irrigation management using PET schedule. There's no way I can cover this every particular situation, every sandy soil, clay loam soil, silt loam soil. There's going to be a, a various factors in here that I'm not going to be able to cover completely. Some of the things that I say may not completely apply to your situation. And in those cases, I want you to apply logic. Okay, if it doesn't make sense or if it doesn't fit your situation, you're going to have to apply logic. And as a matter of fact, to do a lot of this irrigation management with PET, you're going to have to make some logical agronomic decisions as you go through. With that, I want to pose um, one question to you. One thing, in my opinion, there is no good reason not to track potential evapotranspiration. You know, I have growers say, well, I can't irrigate. Not a good reason. I only have a limited amount of water. I can barely keep up with what I'm doing right now. Not a good enough reason. Or I have so much water that I can put as much water on as I want. It's not a good reason. You should track potential evapotranspiration. You should learn how to correlate that to the crop demand. I can assure you the more that you learn about water and crop demand and how that interaction plays out, the better farmer you're going to be able to become. You may be a dry land farmer, but you may get 30% of potential evapotranspiration worth of rain. And I can almost tell you what that yield goal will occur at 30% of DET, and I'll show you that in just a minute. So I want to pose a series of questions to you. How much water does it take to make a bale per acre? If you had to go in and apply for a loan, and you had and you had exactly you know what your well capacity is. Do you know how much water it would take to make one bale per acre? Most people can't answer that. And the reason why is is you would need to know when the planting date was. You would need to know how much rainfall if you were dry land or how much irrigation could be applied in relationship to the crop stage or the crop coefficient. You would also need to have weather data. And then in addition, you need to know what the soil water holding capacity is. So what you really need to know to predict yield is the information that you get from potential evapotranspiration. So that in itself is a strong indictment to learn how to do this. If you want to predict yield, if you want to be able to influence yield, then understanding you know, potential evapotranspiration is the way to do it. If we knew exactly how much water it took to make one bale per acre, can you tell me how much additional water it would take to make two bales? That would actually be easier to answer than the first question. I could come closer to telling you how much more water to add to make that second bale than I can to make that first bale because you don't know how much it's going to rain. You don't know what the wind is going to be, the weather is going to be like. But my point is, is don't, when we irrigate, really, don't we just take what we get? That's what a lot of, a lot of people do. They, they irrigate it, and whatever I get is what I want. That's, that's what I get. When you start learning to track potential evapotranspiration and apply your water applications and your rainfall to a meaning, meaningful crop coefficient, or the amount that the crop actually needs, you're going to be able to predict your yields a lot better. And so when you start looking at yield versus water, if you look at a rain-fed situation, the total inches of water is totally unknown. Your expected yield is totally unknown. And your pounds of litch per inch of water is variable. You can get a whole bunch of water right here in the first of the season, and it still contributes very, very little to rainfall. 
in the 30% of potential evapotranspiration, by 30% of potential evapotranspiration, what I'm saying is if you went to the website, which I'm going to show you how to do, and it said that you needed to apply an inch and a half that week, you would apply 30% of it. Okay? 30% of 100%, you would be applying around uh, what, 6,500, 7,500. Well, under a strict program of 30% of apple transpiration, you should be looking at 9 to 12 inches of full effective water. If you've got 10 inches here right after planting, well, that's not, we're not calling that effective water. If you know, Dr. Creed told you that prior to squaring on cotton, um, early season before the row metals close, you know, you're going to lose most of your water from evaporation. If you're not filling the profile, you're just basically losing a lot of water and it's not effective water. But once you start tracking the evapotranspiration, you know, about bloom or early, you know, mid-square stage, this information will tell you how much the cotton uses every day. And if you can meet a percentage of that demand, that's considered effective water. Okay? So, under the work that I've done with some of my research trials, it takes about 9 to 12 inches of total water, whether it be rainfall or irrigation, and I'm talking about effective water, you should have an expected yield of 7 to 900 pounds, and your pounds of inch per inch is going to run anywhere from 60 to 90 pounds of inch per inch. When you get to 60%, you're looking at 12 to 18 inches, 1,200 to 1,500 pounds per acre, 90 to 120 pounds of length per inch. And then when you get to 90% of PET, you go from 22 to 28 you know, inches, um, 12 to 2,000 pounds per acre, and 60 to 90 um, pounds of lead per inch. And you see you can actually reduce your yields by going from a 60% PET to a 90% PET. When you get a year that you don't have enough growing season to support that crop, you're, you're, out, you're short of heat unit. You create a lot of a top crop and it doesn't mature. So your actual inch length per inch is lower than what it would be in the 60% PET. A 60% PET is about an inch and a quarter, an inch and a third per week of irrigation. Okay. I do have a few growers that can irrigate at 90% potential of apotranspiration. And I always tell them that your chances of hitting that two to two and a half bale I mean, for a 2,000 pound mark is a, is a potential of that is about one out of every four years. And I'll show you a little bit of yield data to support that. So we look at the hypothetical use curve for cotton, and Dr. Creed talked about this. This is as the water demand increases for the cotton crop, and this is where the water demand decreases. And you can see here the emergence. The first square, there's very little, about 0.15 inches. And like I say, this is hypothetical. Inches per day at 100%. And as it gets up in here to, you know, uh, late bloom, early bloom, you should be getting up to potential evapotranspiration rates of three tenths of an inch per day. And so if you were using three tenths of an inch per day, if the cotton, if you were to irrigate it at 100%, you would put on three tenths of an inch a day, or you'd put on 2.1 inches a week. At 60% of PET, you'd put 60% 2.1 inches, which would be about one and a quarter, somewhere in there. Okay. Question three. Will yields increase if you supply above 100% of evapotranspiration? Will they increase? No. So, let me ask you this, and I want you to think about this. How long does you have to irrigate to be above 100% of evapotranspiration? Let's say you get a crop out there and you have the soil profile pretty full and it's that first flower, and you get two inches of rain, and you say, I'm going to keep that sprinkler going because I need to catch up. Are you irrigating above 100% of PET? Yep. And where's the water going? Well, you've got a full profile of water, you've got two inches of rain, fill that profile of water, 
And then you're going to come back in and put an inch on top of it because you you think, I need to keep up. You know, I've been behind and so I'm going to keep up. So you've got this grown pile full of water and you put an inch on top. What's going to happen? An inch is going out the box. You just swap dollars is all you've done. You have to have dry soil to attract moisture. So you really need to be in a situation where you allow the soil to dry somewhat before you apply additional moisture. This is some of the things that, where you just got to apply logic and some of the things that you've always thought may not necessarily be true. Once you start learning how to track this demand and you know precisely how much it's using, you can better keep yourself out of these situations where you make these irrigation management mistakes. Okay, I'm not going to talk about irrigation management aids too much, but be aware that um, there are there's some different technology, and I totally support this technology. Um, the only thing that I have felt like doesn't work real, real well in our area are the gypsum blocks, um, especially on cotton, because they tend to um, actually break suction, or they just quit reading when soil, even before they even get to wilt stage. Um, this is a capacitance probe. I like those a lot. Um, I mentioned the capacitance probe. Uh, a probe goes in the ground. We have a telemetry unit that sends a signal to a website. And it reads the moisture at 6 inch, inch increments all the way down to 48 inches. Uh, those things work very, very well for figuring out how much soap you get into the soil. You can also see the moisture leaving by zone. And another technology is called Smart Field. It's an infrared thermometer. Um, they work uh, real, they work well. It's a good aid. But really let me tell you one thing. Um, there is nothing that comes in a cardboard box that is going to help you understand irrigation management than learning to track potential evapotranspiration. Now I didn't say that they're not useful. But what I'm saying is you have to learn this first. And if you learn how to track potential evapotranspiration and then you employ these management aids like capacitance probes or IRT thermometers, you're going to understand what's going on a whole lot better. Just to have something say, okay, I'm, I'm going to use this capacitance probe or I'm going to use this IRT thermometer and I'm going to irrigate based on what it said, you're just not going to get there. You need to understand potential evapotranspiration. Okay, so how do you get started? This is the point where if you're a farmer, I'm going to tell you how we track potential evapotranspiration and how we make management decisions. First of all, you must have a access to a PET network that uses local weather data. Dr. Craig discussed that. Um, we have absolutely the best PET network in the United States of America right here in Lubbock, Texas. The PET data, the crop coefficients, the weather stations were developed by scientists that are local scientists. Uh, Dr. Creed, USDA, Texas A&M, Texas Tech scientists that developed this for this region so you can't ask for better. And if you're not using this, go on this website, www.tawcsolutions.org. You're really missing out. TAWC is funding and keeping this website going. And if you log on to this website, either as a consultant or as a grower, you pick out a mesonet station that's closest to the place where you farm. You name a field, it could be North Field number 10, and then you put the planting date in there, and that thing that will automatically calculate your daily PET for that field. So you know, it, you know, if you had to pay for this yourself, you know, it would be tremendously expensive. This, all this information is available. You can, you can sit at your kitchen table with an iPad, log on to this site in the morning, drink your cup of coffee, and you can get your potential evapotranspiration data, and you'll know how much your crop is using. And if you know how much your crop is using, you'll know how much irrigation to put on. Okay, you must understand your capacity to irrigate based on peak crop demand, and I'm going to discuss that in a minute. You must know what the soil water holding capacity is for your soil type. Um, Kelly mentioned that. You can go to his website that he was talking about. 
and you can figure out how, what the holding capacity is of the soil, and your irrigation system must be efficient. Okay. So when none of us here can irrigate at 100% of potential evapotranspiration, right? No, no one has that much water. Okay. So you're always going to be irrigating at a percentage of evapotranspiration. You don't have, you can't put on three, three inches a week. And so the way you would do it is let's assume that you can apply 1.25 inches of irrigation per week. And just like Dr. Craig said, it's better to put on an inch and a quarter in a week than put on these half inch applications, you know, over every three days because you're losing so much of the evaporation. More water, less often is better than less water more often. Okay? And even that even applies to drip irrigation, in my opinion. So if you take an inch and a quarter, and you assume that the peak demand at three tenths of an inch per day over a week will be 2.1 inches, you divide one and a quarter by 2.1, you're going to be irrigating at 59% of potential evapotranspiration. That's what your capacity is. You can't irrigate more than that unless it rains, you can add the rain to your irrigation because you don't have the capacity. The reason why this is important is if you irrigate cotton on a stable and consistent matter, manner, and it's exactly 60% of PET, and you do that during the course of the season, you condition that cotton to be producing at a certain level of stress, and your results are always better. You will produce more lint per inch of water. If you've ever been in a situation where you put a lot of water on and you can't sustain it, after you grow a great big plant and you can't sustain that crop after bloom, it's if you're making a mess, you're not conditioning the plant. So this is what this is the justification for trying to irrigate at a certain level. Also, if you are in a very limited irrigation resource area, you will begin to be able to predict yields based on the way you irrigate on a percentage of PET as to what yields that you can expect to achieve. If you can irrigate 60% of PET on 60 acres, you may be a whole lot better off growing 60 acres than 90 acres at 30% of PET. And until you start tracking this and associating yield to percentage of PET, it's hard for you to make those management decisions. And I'll guarantee you, if you'll track this for three years, you can correlate yields better by irrigating in a percentage of PET than you just can by just putting water on when you think you need it. It becomes a benchmark, okay? Okay. So here's, what, here's one strategy we use. Is you know that we always, um, we get yield soil stored moisture and we rely on soil stored moisture to contribute to our yield. We can't put on all the water we need so we women uh, use uh, soil stored moisture. So what we do is Dr. Craig told you that right in here in this early area, you know, most of your water losses are from evaporation. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to apply logic. We want to keep the roots in moisture. You know, during that early period when we're, most of our losses is evaporation. The cotton is not necessarily using, it's just evaporating off. You can't, roots won't grow through dry soil, so you may have to dig a hole, you may have to use a probe, deal it, and see if you have moisture in that root zone. But once you start getting to the canopy cover, then that is when you are going to uh, uh, start using a lot of water. And let's say if you wanted to add some water to the profile. When would you do it? You want to take two inches of water and I want to add it to this profile because that two inches is going to contribute to yields and it's going to give me a little bit of reserve. It's going to give me a little bit of money in the bank. When would you add it? That's where peak demand is. You would come in right around in here where the demand is lower than what you could apply and you would want to apply it close to that point rather than here, because you're going to lose it from evaporation. So you start developing these strategies. So to manage irrigation effectively, you must understand the soil water holding capacity of the soil and the top uh, 
in the, in the soil that's being grown. And so my area, we have clay loam soils, and the initiation of stress is about 1.3 inches per foot. Okay? So we all know about, you know, we're going to fill that profile, we're going to use the soil stored moisture. It, we, at the first, at the top foot, we have plant available moisture 2.4 inches per foot, but the permanent wilting point is 2.4 inches per foot. So we don't ever want to let it get to 2.4 inches per foot. So let's just assume that we have an inch and a half of available moisture in the top three feet. That's going to be the rooting zone, the rooting depth of the top plant. That's four and a half inches of moisture that can contribute to yield. If you can get 80 pounds per length per inch, or 60 pounds per inch, 60 times, you know, four and a half, nearly 300 pounds of length. So you can start playing this game where you start learning the moisture holding capacity of the soil, and you can actually affect your total yield. What I like to do as a supplement to the PET method is you can take the soil and you can feel it. If you get on the Google and do a Google search that says determine moisture by feel, you'll pull up the USDA publication and it will take you through that and it will show you how to feel the soil and get an estimate of what kind of inches per foot that you have. And I, my customers would routinely probe the soil and it gives me an idea of how much moisture I have in the top three feet right prior to flower. And I try to build that a little bit when I have the capacity to do it. And it's a, it's a good technique. I'm not going to go into it. Most growers do not have enough water to compensate for the inefficient irrigation system. And a lot of what I tell you today about tracking PET is not going to work well for you if you have an inefficient irrigation system. Okay, we basically have, um, you know, we, most of the water here is delivered either with drip irrigation or leaf system. Uh, if you have 50% efficiency and you apply one inch, you only get a half inch to the crop. Most broadcast spray systems uh, are in that 50% efficiency range. And then a leaf system, low energy precision application, um, would be an efficiency of eight tenths of an inch. Uh, per inch. So you gain three tenths of an inch and you say, well, that really didn't make, make that much difference. But if you were in a 12 inch irrigation zone that you applied at 50%, you only put six inches available to the plant and that took you from 60% of PET down to 30% PET. And that's pretty significant. If you take that same 80% in LIPA and put 12, point inches, 12 inches on, that's 9.6. That's a difference of 3.6 inches for the same amount of water applied times 80 pounds per inch is 288 pounds of land. And it, it, this stuff works. Now, there are, this is one of these areas where you've got to apply logic. I have seen these dribbler LEPA systems. You see how this LEPA it kind of bubbles it out? Those are the ones I like. You can put the narrow water on too narrow of a bat. Some of the new LEPA nozzles are those dribbler nozzles, and the water just comes straight down. And, you know, what the people at the irrigation company, they designed a, a neat nozzle. But what they didn't tell you is if you're going to use that leaper nozzle that just puts that water out straight down, you need to alternate for a backing. Because you are not going to be reaching the roots by just putting the water in a three or four inch band here. And so you've got a dike to back up that water. So once again, you're in a position where you're, you've got to apply logic. Okay, here's how it works. Okay, you log on to the website, you put in your, uh, your weather station, and then it's going to generate some figures for you. Okay, so we're going to, here's how we're going to figure, we're going to figure a, a, an irrigation. We're going to calculate this. First of all, when you figure it, it's not going to show you the 20th, 21st, today's the 20th of July. You're not going to see this because it hadn't happened yet. Everybody follow me? So we're going to just, just kind of ignore this for right now. So here we are on the 21st, and we're looking at the data on the 20th, and we see that we're in early bloom and at 100% of PET 
It's 0.27 inches. We didn't get any rainfall that day, so I'm going to irrigate it 60% of 100, which this is 100, and I'm going to have an accumulated need of 0.16 inches. Then I come here on the 22nd, and I'm going to download, and it's going to give me the data for the 21st, and it said, well, I used another 0.26 times 60%, added to that, I'm 0.32 deficit. In other words, I need 0.32 inches at 60% of PET. Then I come here on the 23rd, and it says, I look at the 22nd data, and it says 0.28, and the same thing, it starts to add up. The 20, 23rd, see, we got up to mid-bloom, and we're three-tenths of an inch, went to 0.67, and so forth. The 24th, we're up to 1.86. The 25th, we're up to 1.05. The 26th, we're up to 1.22 inches. We're going to irrigate. We want to air, trigger an irrigation when we have 1.25 inches, because that's our capacity to irrigate at 60% of PET. We want to make, doesn't matter if it's six days, seven days, five days, when we get to 1.25, that's our capacity to irrigate, we want to train that cotton. But actually, when we come in here, we're not going to see this data until the 27th, because the day, you, they can't produce data until the day's over. So we're going to come here on the 27th, and it rained the night of the 26th, and we got three quarters of an inch. So what does that happen to our balance? If that's effective rainfall and it didn't run off, we're at 0.64. We're going to irrigate? Nope. We're going to go another day, and it comes up to 0.82. We're going to go up another day, and when we get to 1.25, we're going to irrigate it. This stuff works. Okay, and then this irrigation strategy I briefly covered, we're going to want to try to, it works best if you can have some reserve moisture in the profile, and we normally put it in there at first blue. Okay, I want to show you a little bit of data. I started doing graph tolerance research in 2006. A lot of the work I did was with Monsanto. This is an old variety, so I'm not trying to tell anybody a cotton variety or tell you one variety better than another. I don't even know if this variety is even available, but this is one of the first ones they found. It seemed to have good water efficiency across all these different irrigation ranges, you know, range 30, 60, and 90. And uh, there's a lot of companies doing water research now and figuring out that there are some varieties that respond real, real well here in these lower ranges, but yet don't hold up on the higher ranges. There are some varieties that respond higher for uh, you know, just vice versa, okay? So don't worry about the variety. I just want to show you a, a, a one year's data, a very simple test. So we had a rain fed plot that we basically kept it alive right until it got into the squaring and then we didn't, all it had was rainfall. And that year we actually had 9.4 inches of rain and it produced a yield of 475 pounds of lint per acre. It produced 50.5 pounds of lint per inch. <clears throat> that rainfall, did not necessarily fall every time the crop needed to be watered. Sometimes it got hot, sometimes you know, it fluctuated. So it didn't just really line up with that demand curve, okay? But then we got into 30% PET and we started lining that water up right with the demand curve. If it needed water at 30%, we put it off. Then we came back a week later. If it needed water at 30%, we put it off. And look at the difference in the yield. We went four inches of water went from 475 to 1,111. When you manage water, the percentage of PET, this becomes predictable, okay? We actually increased 13.4 inches. That's not very much water, okay? 82.9 pounds of lint per inch. Then 60% of PET, we had eight more inches of irrigation, same amount of rainfall, brought it up to 17.4 inches, Look there, it went to 1,849 pounds. You see that step. So from range at 30, 60, you see a step. Every, every, every uh, irrigation regime, 106.3 pounds of rent per inch. Then we went to 90% PET, total of 12 inches, 21.4 in that particular year. We actually had some early rain to fill the soil profile. Um, don't get too you know, there's some rainfall in there that occurred early that it may actually be uh, included in the figures because it wasn't considered effective. Um, but the point is, is you only went barely increase the yields of 100 pounds. 
you know, going from 90 percent and put an extra four inches of irrigation on it. You know, you figure your irrigation costs 15 to 20 dollars an inch when you fix the tires and you pay the electricity and pump run the well, and that was 60 dollars that just got lost in there. And so, and then you drop down to 90.4 pounds of lint per inch when you start applying water. You know, people say, oh, you know, this potential vapor transpiration. Folks, it is a better way. It is a way that you can make more money with the water you have than it, it, it doesn't have anything to do with making, you know, using less, making less. It's just like, it's just efficiency is what it is. This was 60% PET on my, my farm, my research farm, 2.8 bales per acre. Yeah. Anybody have any questions?